Hello and good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to our webinar tonight. Uh, it's one of our series of NYGA uh, webinars. Uh, my name is Anna Tsuyama and I'm a gastroenterologist at uh, the New York Gastroenterology Associates, NYGA. Uh, we are a premier private GI group based in New York City with offices in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, our group comprises of uh, 16 gastroenterologists, uh, three nutritionists and an amazing support staff. We provide uh, consultations, uh, a wide uh, range of diagnostic tests and procedures covering a variety of gastrointestinal problems. Uh, today it is my pleasure to introduce my dear colleague and amazing gastroenterologist, Dr. Steve Namagon. Um, Dr. Namagon has a, an impressive resume and has been part of the Mount Sinai Hospital for many years. Uh, we are lucky to have him in our group. Uh, he's got his medical degree at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and then went on to do his medical training in internal medicine and gastroenterologist at Mount Sinai. And being the amazing provider he is, um, he has remained faculty at Mount Sinai over the last seven years since he completed his training. Today, um, Dr. Namagon will be talking and addressing questions on GERD, uh, one of the most common reasons for a gastroenterology consultation. And uh, just a few uh, reminders before I turn over to Dr. Namagon. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our NYGA website. You can also find other webinars in our website as well. And please use the Q&A function to ask any questions you have, and we will certainly try to address them after Dr. Namagon's talk. And uh, while we can provide medical advice during, uh, in this forum, we can definitely answer questions uh, for educational purposes. So without uh, further ado, I would like to hand it over to, to you, Steve. Thanks, Dr. Tuyama, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, what I'd like to accomplish in the next um, uh, 30 to 45 minutes is to give a, a, a brief overview of uh, acid reflux and uh, then uh, leave uh, adequate time for, uh, for as many questions as we can get to. Um, so uh, before we get started, uh, just a few um, disclosures. I have no conflicts of interest to, uh, to disclose, but uh, the only disclosure I have to make is I'd like to thank my uh, talented uh, a colleague, Dr. Ugo Iroku, for num not only uh, inviting me to speak, but also coming up with this catchy title, uh, which I cannot take any credit for. So what do we uh, want to talk about in the next, uh, in the next hour? So first, uh, what causes acid reflux? or GERD, what symptoms are associated with acid reflux? What are the complications of acid reflux? How are patients with acid reflux evaluated? And how is acid reflux treated? So when we talk about acid reflux, the organ we talk about is the esophagus. Uh, the esophagus is a tube-like structure that uh, is about 10 inches in length. It sits in the chest. Um, and carries food from the stomach, uh, from the mouth down into, into the stomach. Um, the esophagus is not just a tube. It is a muscular structure. It has a muscular wall that uh, contracts in wave-like um, contractions called peristalsis that propels food. You can see a food bolts here down through the esophagus into the stomach. Uh, at the upper end of the esophagus, the upper esophageal sphincter, which opens when we swallow. And at the lower end of the esophagus, very appropriately, is the lower esophageal sphincter. And the lower esophage esophageal sphincter is a, uh, a band of muscle that opens and closes as we swallow. And uh, during uh, the time when we're not swallowing, it stays contracted to prevent uh, regurgitation. So in uh, the non-eating uh, state, uh, the lower esophageal sphincter stays closed for the most part and prevents stomach contents from refluxing back up into the esophagus. However, the lower esophageal sphincter does intermittently open to allow uh, substances to exit. Primarily, this, is, uh, this happens when gas needs to exit, when people need to uh, burp. Um, 
However, some liquid can also exit. Uh, this happens to everyone, and this is normal. Uh, most of these episodes occur after meals. They're very brief, and they do not cause any symptoms uh, because the refluxate, or the fluid that refluxes up, is rapidly cleared back into the stomach, and no harm is done to the esophagus. However, in some people, um, this reflux can become more significant and cause more bothersome symptoms uh, or injury to the esophagus, which uh, unlike uh, the stomach is really ill-equipped to handle acid. Uh, and this is what we call gastroesophageal reflux disease as opposed to simple acid reflux. Uh, in general, uh, this occurs uh, when there are more frequent uh, and more longer-term relaxations of the lower esophageal sphincter, um, or when there is a chronic abnormal laxity of the lower esophageal sphincter. And this allows more stomach contents to reflux back into the esophagus. So again, a lot of this goes back to the problem with the lower esophageal sphincter. And how common is this problem? It is exceedingly common. Uh, some studies show that up to 20% of people in the Western world have are diagnosed with gastroesophageal reflux disease. And this is probably a gross underestimate because some people just have bad acid reflux and they don't re uh, report their sy symptoms to their doctors. So um, what is it that actually causes uh, some people to have bad acid reflux? A lot of it comes down to, as we were saying, to, the, to, to this lower esophageal sphincter. And um, so uh, what are the things that influence the lower esophageal sphincter? So one is uh, eating habits. So uh, some foods uh, that we'll, we'll go over a little bit later um, actually decrease the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, another uh, risk factor for GERD and uh, lower esophageal sphincter dysfunction is, is obesity. Uh, there is a strong correlation between uh, being overweight and having acid reflux. Um, the thought here is that um, intra-abdominal pressure causes uh, um, laxity of the lower esophageal sphincter and causes more things to, to reflux uh, into the esophagus. Um, certain medications can cause the lower esophageal sphincter to inappropriately relax. Um, for example, certain uh, blood pressure medications can do this uh, and certain medications used for, uh, for heart conditions can do this. Pregnancy is a big one. So pregnancy causes um, uh, GERD uh, in two ways. The first is that uh, pregnancy hormones, uh, estrogen and progesterone, reduce lower esophageal sphincter tone. And also the gravid uterus just pushes up on the stomach and causes things to, to reflux. Uh, smoking and alcohol uh, are recognized uh, as things that lower the tone of the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. And the condition called hiatal hernia can also, uh, can also do this. So uh, what is a hiatal hernia? Um, well, as you can see here in this di diagram, the, uh, the stomach is down here and the esophagus is up here and the separation is the diaphragm. Uh, and in some cases, the, a part of the stomach can actually bulge above the diaphragm and sit in the chest. And this bulging disrupts the normal lower esophageal sphincter and uh, allows more acid reflux to occur. So what are the symptoms of acid reflux? Well, the most common symptoms are gastrointestinal. Uh, heartburn or pyrosis is the, uh, it's a burning sensation in the chest, uh, usually occurs after meals. Um, another uh, common symptom is regurgitation or actually a feeling of food and, uh, and stomach contents refluxing up into the esophagus and sometimes even back into the stomach. Some people experience excessive belching uh, and other people experience nausea or even uh, frequent vomiting. Uh, another symptom of GERD could be difficulty swallowing and we'll touch upon this a little bit more in a moment. In addition to gastrointestinal symptoms, there are some non-GI symptoms that can be associated with, uh, with GERD. This includes chest pain, a chronic dry cough, a hoarse voice, a sore throat, and even asthma as acid comes up and irritates the respiratory tract. Now, while most GERD symptoms are very mild and innocuous, there are some symptoms that point 
uh, to a more serious problem. And we refer to these as alarm symptoms. And these can include difficulty swallowing, weight loss, bleeding, which could include um, uh, both blood in the stool, uh, coughing up blood or vomiting blood, or being anemic on routine blood tests, uh, chest pain, or frequent vomiting. And when any of these symptoms are present, it makes us more concerned that there could be some complications of acid reflux um, that have uh, arisen. And what are these complications? What can uh, longstanding acid reflux uh, cause? So I will, I'll preface this by saying that most people with GERD will not develop any serious complications, especially if they get treated. However, the things that we do worry about are uh, the following. So the first thing I'll mention is esophagitis. So esophagitis is, is inflammation of the esophagus. So uh, seen here are endoscopic pictures. So these are pictures from an endoscopy looking at the esophagus. For, for your reference here is a normal esophagus. It has this nice, smooth, pale lining. And here is an esophagus that has esophagitis. So you can see this redness and these breaks in the lining, almost as if someone took their fingernails and scraped, um, scraped off a layer. Another complication are esophageal ulcers. And ulcers are actually deeper than erosions and deeper than esophagitis, uh, which makes the distinction. And these things can cause uh, significant pain, can lead to trouble swallowing, and they can also cause bleeding if they erode into, a, uh, into blood vessels in the esophagus. Another possible complication are esophageal strictures. So recurrent uh, acid reflux causes, can cause a cycle of your inflammation and repair, inflammation and repair, inflammation and repair in the esophagus. And over time, this cycle can cause scarring and the scarring can form a stricture or a narrowing. And this narrowing can uh, make it difficult for food and pills to pass through, leading to trouble swallow. And in severe cases, things can actually get stuck in the esophagus. A very common concern in people with chronic acid reflux is something called Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus occurs when the normal cells that line the lower esophagus are replaced by a different cell type as the esophagus tries to protect itself from chronic acid reflux. As you can see in this picture, the normal esophagus should look pale, whereas the salmon colored lining is what's called Barrett's esophagus, and this is abnormal. Uh, this process usually results from repeated damage of the esophageal lining from long acting or long standing uh, acid reflux. Uh, the new lining, and this is why Barrett's esophagus is important, this new lining predisposes people to the formation of uh, or the development of esophageal cancer. Now, just uh, as a, uh, an important point is that very, very few people with Barrett's esophagus will develop esophageal cancer, but it does increase the risk over the general population. And speaking of cancer, this is the complication that we most want to avoid. This is a uh, picture of a tumor in the esophagus. Um, some, but not all, esophageal cancers are associated with GERD. Uh, and esophageal cancer in general is a relatively rare cancer in the US, accounting for probably about 1% of all cancers diagnosed in the United States. So how do we evaluate people who would suspected GERD? Well, the first step is a consultation with a healthcare provider. And if someone has classic symptoms of GERD, and these classic symptoms are heartburn and regurgitation, a healthcare provider can take a thorough history, ask all the right questions, and make a diagnosis just from that conversation alone. And typically what we would, we would then do is uh, prescribe a course of an acid suppressing medicine to treat what we presume is GERD, and if the person feels better, then uh, that not only uh, helps uh, diagnose the problem, but also helps treat the problem. However, if uh, the, uh, in this empiric trial of medication doesn't help, uh, your doctor or your healthcare provider may want to perform further testing. 
And the first test that usually gets uh, recommended is an endoscopy. So an endoscopy is a test that allows a doctor to directly examine the upper gastrointestinal tract. Uh, while the patient is uh, sedated with anesthesia, a small, uh, skinny, flexible tube with a camera is passed through the esophagus down into the stomach and the first part of the small intestine. And this allows us to inspect the lining of, the, of all of these organs and it allows us to detect any of those complications that we just spoke about, such as esophagitis, ulcers, strictures, and so forth. In addition, upper endoscopy also allows us to take samples of the lining of the esophagus and the stomach to look for inflammatory infectious conditions and other uh, abnormalities. Uh, another commonly performed test is an esophagram. So this is a radiology test in which the person is asked to drink contrast, which is a, a solution that lights up on x-rays. And then a series of x-rays is taken that allows us to see how the contrast travels down the esophagus. And this allows us to see if there are any narrowings or abnormalities in the structure of the esophagus. And sometimes it also acts uh, allows us to see whether the contrast then refluxes back up into the esophagus after it is uh, swallowed. Another common test uh, in people with uh, acid reflux or GERD is esophageal manometry. So as we mentioned before, the esophagus is not just a pipe. It's a muscular tube uh, and manometry allows us to assess the function of those muscles. So this test involves passing a skinny probe through the nostril, down the back of the throat, and down into the esophagus and into the stomach. The probe then sits there for a few minutes as you perform a few maneuvers, such as swallowing, drinking, and eating. And while you're uh, performing these maneuvers, the probes in this, uh, the, the probes can measure the pressure of the esophageal contraction and can actually tell us if the muscles of the esophagus are working properly and if the lower esophageal sphincter is contracting and opening properly. Probably the most definitive test for diagnosing GERD is esophageal pH testing. Similar to the esophageal manometry, this involves passing a skinny tube through the nostril, down the esophagus, and into the stomach. As, but in this case, the, this uh, probe measures pH or acidity, as well as the presence of fluid in the esophagus. During the test, the patient is asked to wear a little uh, recorder that measures and records all of the data that's being captured by the probe and also allows the patient to, um, to note when they have symptoms, to allow for a correlation between the symptoms that the person is having and what is going on physiologically in the esophagus. Um, this can also be done through a different type of test where a little, uh, little device is placed at the lower end of the esophagus through endoscopy, and um, that avoids the need for um, the, um, the probe sitting in the, in the nostril for 24 hours, which is appealing for a lot of people. Okay, so now we have uh, diagnosed acid reflux. We've uh, um, uh, done all the appropriate tests. How do we treat uh, the, the person with acid reflux? Well, uh, the first step are um, diet and lifestyle modifications. And certain lifestyle and dietary changes can often really help relieve a lot of the symptoms of GERD. Um, and if the symptoms are mild, um, one can really try these symptoms by themselves without actually con um, uh, consulting a, uh, a doctor first. Uh, so in terms of diet, what are the foods that generally um, people should avoid if they have uh, significant acid reflux? Well, the first are fried and fatty foods. Um, chocolate, peppermint, um, alcohol, coffee, carbonated beverages, condiments such as ketchup, mustard, vinegar, tomato sauce, and citrus fruits or juices. And the common theme here is that a lot of these things are very acidic, and some of them are known to decrease the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter. 
Um, now, it can be difficult to identify exactly which foods are going to trigger symptoms in which individual. So a consultation with a dietitian can be very helpful in these situations to help design a meal plan that can help um, battle uh, symptoms of GERD. In terms of lifestyle modifications, um, one of the most helpful things is eating smaller portions. When we eat, the stomach expands. And if the stomach expands too much, it uh, allows things to reflux back up into the esophagus. So smaller meals are definitely helpful for people with significant GERD. Avoid eating late. Uh, if you eat a large meal and then get right into bed, uh, gravity starts to work against us and uh, food can reflux back from the stomach into the esophagus passively. Elevate the head of the bed. So this relates to what we were just saying. Um, Sometimes putting a few small blocks under the head of the bed or using a wedge pillow can help uh, actually uh, allow gravity to work for us as opposed to against us by helping clear secretions and uh, fluid that refluxes into the esophagus while we're laying down. Now, an important point here is that some people um, use multiple pillows to help elevate the head of their bed. Now, this is actually not uh, that's going to actually be counterproductive because if you use multiple pillows, it actually causes your stomach to kind of scrunch up and that uh, causes to, uh, you to have more intra-abdominal pressure. It can actually make reflux worse. So if you're going to try this, then uh, using a wedge pillow or putting blocks under the head of the bed might be more, uh, more efficacious. Uh, maintain a healthy weight. So um, as we mentioned before, obesity is uh, strongly correlated with acid reflux uh, and losing weight, even five or 10 pounds can make a significant difference for a lot of people in terms of their GERD symptoms. Stop smoking. Um, smoking causes worsening acid reflux for a number of reasons. Um, so one of the things that helps protect us against acid reflux is actually saliva because it helps neutralize acid that gets refluxed. And uh, smoking actually decreases saliva production. In addition, as we mentioned before, smoking lowers the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter. Okay, so if these things fail, then we move on to medications. So um, the first uh, class of medications that are commonly prescribed are antacids. And these things serve to simply neutralize stomach acid. They are very fast acting, uh, they're very safe, and they work um, for, a, but they work for a very short period of time and really are most effective for people with mild infrequent acid reflux or GERD. If acid reflux becomes more frequent or more bothersome, typically we step up to a class of medicines called histamine receptor antagonists or H2 blockers. Um, these medicines include things like cimetidine or tagamet and famotidine like Pepsid. And these medicines actually decrease the production of acid in the stomach. They're longer acting um, and they may have some rare uh, side effects such as headache, upset stomach, constipation, or diarrhea. Um, an important uh, thing to point out here is that um, a lot of you may remember in, uh, a year or two ago, uh, another H2 blocker called ranitidine or Zantac was taken off the market. Uh, and this happened um, after some testing showed that some, uh, some products were, uh, in the tablets um, were uh, associated with an increased risk of cancer if taken for a prolonged period of time. So that uh, those are no longer available in the US. However, uh, the most uh, powerful treatment we have against acid reflux are the proton pump inhibitors. So these um, strongly reduce stomach acid production and are the most effective treatment for people with more severe acid reflux symptoms. Uh, there's a plethora of PPIs on the market. Uh, these include um, drugs like Nexium, Prevacid, Prilosec, Protonix, Asifex, uh, and so forth. And most of them are actually available over the counter. 
Um, these are these medications are very safe, but they can cause rare side effects such as back pain, cough, headache, dizziness, abdominal pain, and gas, uh, nausea, constipation, or diarrhea. Now, typically, if someone has significant acid reflux, this is uh, one of the class of medications that we'll, we'll prescribe, and typically we'll keep the the patient on these medications for a few weeks, maybe up to a few months, and then try and taper them off. Um, if once we taper the medications off, um, if the person feel continues to feel well off of them, then they can stay off of them. Um, but if um, symptoms recur, these medications can be resumed. And it's important to note that we always want to try to keep people on the lowest effective dose of these medications. Now, PPIs have had um, have um, had some bad press in the past couple of years um, because of concerns for side effects. Um, in general, PPIs are very very safe. As I mentioned before, you can go to any drugstore and buy a PPI right this minute. Um, however, there are some um, side effects that have been uh, noted. So one is that long-term PPI use is associated with certain, with an increased risk of certain infections. Uh, one of them is something called Clostridium difficile or C. diff, which is a gastrointestinal infection. Uh, another um, side effect is the um, in inhibition of absorption of certain nutrients, including things like magnesium, vitamin B12, and calcium. Um, there is also some uh, weak evidence that PPIs can cause problems with the kidneys over a long term uh, if, if used long term. Um, other, um, uh, other issues have been brought up but are very controversial and have really never been um, uh, definitively proven. And these include problems with memory or dementia, an increased risk of infection with COVID-19, or uh, any risk of developing any cancers. So in general, these things are incredibly rare, and this is a very safe class of medications. Okay, so what if medications are not working? Uh, there are now several endoscopic procedures that are used to treat GERD. Um, this is one procedure that's um, become very popular in the last couple of years. It's called transoral incisionless fundoplication, or TIF. And this is a procedure in which an endoscopy is performed, just like we talked about before, where a camera is passed into the stomach. There's a special attachment on the endoscope, and that attachment allows the doctor to actually cinch up or almost like staple the lower esophageal sphincter to make it more tight and prevent acid reflux from occurring. If medications and endoscopic procedures fail, however, there's always the option of anti-reflux surgery. And, and the most common anti-reflux surgery is something called the Nissen fundoplication. And this is a procedure in which the surgeon wraps the upper part of the stomach around the lower part of the esophagus, essentially strengthening the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, patients must be very carefully selected for uh, anti-reflux surgery because it doesn't work for everybody. And following the surgery, some people may experience symptoms such as a bloated feeling and a difficulty belching because gas might have trouble escaping up through the new, newly constructed lower esophageal sphincter. Okay, so um, to sum up, GERD is the abnormal bothersome reflux of stomach contents into the esophagus, often caused by laxity of the lower esophageal sphincter. GERD can manifest uh, in a number of ways, including heartburn, regurgitation, difficulty swallowing, uh, as well as other uh, various non-GI symptoms. Chronic GERD can lead to various complications, including esophagitis, esophageal ulceration and stenosis, and Barrett's esophagus. Evaluation of GERD includes consultation with a healthcare provider, endoscopy, esophageal motility studies, and esophageal pH testing. And GERD can be managed with dietary and lifestyle interventions, 
various medications, and endoscopic or surgical procedures. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I'd like to open it up for, uh, for questions. All right. Uh, give me one second. Uh, thank you, Steve. That was like a wonderful talk and, uh, and uh, terrific and a uh, great overview of GERD. I, I certainly learned a lot. And uh, I noticed like um, a couple of questions from our audience. Um, let me see something that came up and uh, you might want to go over again. Give me one second. There are a lot of questions. One is um, uh, there were a couple of maybe two or three questions asking whether cough, phlegm, and um, hoarseness are symptoms like of acid reflux. So maybe you can go over again, like typical and atypical symptoms of GERD. Absolutely. So that's a, those are great questions. Um, so as we mentioned, there are um, gastrointestinal and non-gastrointestinal symptoms of, of GERD. And the non-gastrointestinal symptoms do include some of the symptoms that, that the, um, the audience inquired about. Um, the way that the, these symptoms develop is um, the irritation of the throat and even the upper respiratory tract by, by acid. Um, the, um, a simple way to assess this is to either do a trial of a medication for acid reflux to see if these symptoms go away or to do formal testing, such as the pH testing that we talked about to assess whether there is significant acid reflux. And the pH study that I mentioned before that where the uh, catheter is passed through the nose down into the esophagus, I know that doesn't sound very appealing, but it's a very informative study because it not only shows us whether there is acid in the esophagus, but whether fluid is actually coming up um, uh, up the esophagus. Uh, now, a number of things can cause cough and a sore throat and hoarse voice. So um, consultation with an ear, nose and throat specialist and a pulmonologist may be necessary to rule out other things such as post-nasal drip or, um, or other ENT um, problems. All right, that, uh, I, I totally agree with that. Um, there are a couple more questions. I'm trying to kind of like outline them by symptoms and then diagnostic tests and treatment. Uh, so again, uh, over symptoms of um, a GERD, another question about like, but again, in the same line on like, um, can like bitterness and foul, ta foul taste in the mouth uh, be a symptom of acid uh, reflux? Uh, like the taste when you take antibiotics. And I would say that that's a yes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So that the symptom of water brash or that really sour taste in the back of the throat is, uh, is a common symptom of, uh, of acid reflux. I didn't include that um, uh, explicitly, but I would sort of uh, file that under regurgitation and that regurgitation can be, can be pretty, uh, um, pretty upsetting uh, if, it, if it tastes uh, sour like that. And then the other thing, a couple of patients like highlighted and kind of like asked, uh, you know, uh, the risks of like um, GERD and the association with sleep apnea and uh, pulmonary diseases like bronchiac disease and asthma. That's a, that's a great question. And that's um, certainly couldn't cover the scope of all of the potential complications of um, of GERD in this, uh, in this talk, but um, chronic acid reflux, um, as we were mentioning before, can, um, can actually lead to um, the, um, the irritation of the, of the respiratory tract by acid, and, uh, and that can lead to more, more serious pulmonary complications. The most common thing that we see is exacerbation of asthma symptoms, but uh, over a long period of time, you can develop more serious pulmonary complications, such as bronchiectasis. Um, which is, again, not to say that all bronchiectasis is, is caused by GERD or that every person GERD is going to develop lung or pulmonary symptoms. Um, but uh, this is definitely something that should be assessed in, in concert with a pulmonologist. I agree. Um, in regards to like PPIs and proton pump inhibitors, a, a couple of questions. One, um, do you recommend taking something before a meal or something after? 
That's a great question. So in terms of um, timing of medications, um, the question is, um, are we trying to prevent symptoms or are we trying to treat symptoms? Um, if the goal, if, if you eat a slice of pizza and you develop uh, heartburn, um, you're probably not uh, going to be very well served by taking a PPI or uh, something like Nexium or Prilosec, because those medicines um, don't have the fastest onset. Um, you may be better off taking an antacid in, the, in that situation after the meal. Um, I guess if you're very proactive, you can actually take that, take it before the meal. If you know you're going to eat something that typically um, causes heartburn for you. Um, the proton pump inhibitors typically um, are used for um, longer durations to prevent acid reflux symptoms or to treat complications of acid reflux, such as esophagitis, ulcers, and so forth, as we spoke about. Um, so those medications typically are, um, uh, are given on an empty stomach in the mornings. Um, and again, those are uh, sort of the, the, the medicines that we use to prevent symptoms of acid reflux in people with chronic, uh, long-standing, ongoing GERD. That's right. And um, one of my favorite questions that came up like maybe uh, a few times, um, uh, can PPIs be beneficial on an as needed basis or like, um, I, I guess that was one question. And the other is like uh, taking courses of PPI as opposed to, you know, taking it on a daily basis. Uh, what are the pros and cons? That's a, that's a great question. So I, um, in general, when I, um, when I prescribe a PPI, I advise people that this is going to be a, um, a fire prevention strategy. So if we think of, uh, of GERD as a, as a fire, uh, so one of the things we may want to do is put out the fire. So treat the, treat the symptoms, and that is going to be accomplished more readily by antacids and H2 blockers. Um, whereas the fire prevention strategy, so let's, let's uh, put in some alarms, uh, you know, some sprinklers and stuff like that. And, uh, and, alarm, and uh, fire alarms, that's going to be more the PPI. Um, so uh, while uh, a lot of people do take PPIs on an as needed basis, um, I don't think that's the, their primary um, indication. And uh, I think most people will be better served by taking something more fast acting in those situations. Um, in terms of multiple courses of PPIs, this is something that I actually think is, is very reasonable and very effective. Um, so uh, if you go to your local Walgreens right now and you pick up a, a, um, a, a package of Prilosec OTC, it'll be a two-week course. And um, a lot of the time people will take those, uh, that two-week course and will feel great. We'll stop the medicine and then we'll continue to feel great for several months and then if their symptoms recur, they'll take another two-week course and they'll, and they'll feel better. And I think that's a very reasonable uh, approach. Uh, what do you think, Anna? Uh, I agree. I agree. And it works for some people. You know, sometimes um, patients have a flare-up and they will take, of course, sometimes I usually use longer than 14 days to like put the fire down and, uh, and patients feel well for a while. And you can always, in between, if you're having occasional symptoms, take like a, an H2 blocker like Pepsid or antiacids and then minimize like the chronic use of PPIs, you know, which comes like, and then another question was like, can PPI, uh, BI, PPIs, BID used for long periods of time? And I think, you know, everything, and I, I would like to hear what you have to say, everything has its place and, and um, every person is different. And uh, sometimes it's necessary, and I, I don't know what your thoughts are on it, you know? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question that comes up all the time, and um, I think when I try to answer this question when a patient asks me is, I try to um, try to say, so what is, the, what is the risk of the medication versus what is the risk of the disease that we're treating? So if, uh, you know, you have uncomplicated mild GERD, um, I wouldn't say that you need to take a, a PPI at all, perhaps, or certainly not double dose PPI to prevent any, some, any inkling of GERD ever, um, because that's sort of like uh, going after a fly with a sledgehammer. Um, however, if we're treating something like Barrett's esophagus, which has some, some real possible complications, or severe esophagitis, or, um, or esophageal ulcers, then... Um, twice a day PPI dosing may be very appropriate. 
again, risk of the disease versus the risk of the medication. However, um, if we can uh, treat the underlying problem, so treat, uh, cure the esophagitis, uh, cure the ulcers, um, then we can try and back off the dose to the lowest effective dose. Um, and um, if um, taking a long-term PPI uh, allows you to function normally, not have uh, chronic constant symptoms, uh, prevents uh, long-term complications, uh, such as esophagitis and Barrett's, then it, I think it makes all the sense in the world to take the medication as opposed to, to have the, the risk of the symptoms and the disease. That's right. And I would highlight that uh, for those patients that are taking um, PPIs like twice daily and uh, anti-acids and are still having symptoms of acid reflux, that's when you really need uh, to reach out to your gastroenterologist, you know, to um, determine whether, you know, it's a still, you're still having acid reflux or is, if there is something else going on, you know, because um, that's, you know, always um, something that needs to be investigated. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, not, not all heartburn symptoms or not all esophageal symptoms are, are GERD. I, I'm really glad, glad you brought that up. And, and one of the, um, the things that we, we can do with some of the studies that we discussed is rule out other conditions that may be treated differently um, or, um, uh, or even, or, or change the, our, our focus. Uh, so if, uh, if we think that you have GERD and then we do some studies and say, huh, it's actually eosinophilic esophagitis or it's uh, some sort of hypersensitivity syndrome that really changes uh, the course of treatment. That's right. Um, another question, and that's something I get from patients all the time in regards to um, low acid or hypochloridria in, in the diagnosis and treatment of GERG, you know, for patients that have little acid in the stomach. Any, any thoughts on that? That's, that's a little controversial, I would say. Yeah, so um, the... Um, you know, the most common reason for people to have um, low acid in the stomach is actually um, medications. So the, all the medications that we spoke about, or a lot of them, including the proton pump inhibitors and the H2 blockers, uh, inhibit uh, stomach acid production. Um, so the, those people will have low stomach acid, uh, people on those medicines. And for the most part, they have uh, less, uh, less heartburn symptoms. Um, there are other conditions that can cause low acid, and, but these are pretty rare, such as um, autoimmune atrophic gastritis. Um, and to be honest, uh, and I'm not sure if, um, if those patients have more or less GERD uh, symptoms. Um, in your experience, do you have a, a sense of, of um, the prevalence of acid reflux in, in those populations? No, uh, but, you know, you do see sometimes patients uh, who um, have like atrophic gastritis and still have like some dyspeptic or acid reflux symptoms. Um, and I, I like, I, you know, we, I often get questions from patients in regards to treating acid with acid. And um, I don't think we have like a, a lot of science to, to back that up, you know, like, uh, in, uh, so a few questions here were about like the low, uh, acidity, like low acidic and stomach in the treatment of, uh, um, uh, wait, wait a second, sorry. Uh, no, in using acid to treat acid reflux, you know, like for instance, like uh, apple cider vinegar. And I think we, we talked about that. And I don't think we have like enough science to back it up, uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's out there and you find it in the internet. Um, and um, I, I don't see any harm in trying, but um, uh, we don't usually, I don't usually recommend this therapy for, for GERD. Yeah, that's, that's a, that one is, you know, still baffles me a little bit. It's, it seems very counterintuitive, like you said, you know, fighting uh, acid with acid, but, um, but there is, uh, like you said, a, a strong web presence for apple cider vinegar uh, for all kinds of conditions. Um, there's, there's no, however, there's no um, scientific literature to back it up. So in terms of how it works, well, there's some theories that um, if you have, um, if you have very, very low um, stomach acidity, 
it, it may actually um, cause the lower esophageal sphincter to be more lax. So by, take, by um, taking an acidic substance, it can actually sort of cinch up the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter. There's also some thought that, you know, if you're drinking a dilute acid, it actually um, dilutes the acid in your stomach and that's how it, it works. But um, I'm not sure if we really understand how apple cider vinegar works in GERD or if it works for GERD. Now, some people swear by it. And uh, like you said, Anna, you know, if someone, if it works for someone, I say, I think it's okay to take it every once in a while, as long as it's being done safely. So you need to dilute it in uh, usually with warm water and um, take very small amounts. And, um, you know, cause chronic use um, is also not totally innocuous, you know, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's hundred percent safe. Um, drinking acid can, um, can cause dental problems and actually the acid passing through your upper esophagus can irritate the upper esophagus. So um, certainly it's not a, um, a perfect uh, natural solution. That's right. Um, a couple of questions. One in regards to uh, hiatal hernia, is it something reversible or something that can be treated or should be treated? Yeah, hiatal hernias are, um, it seems to me are, are exceedingly common. You know, we see it all the time endoscopically um, when we uh, do endoscopy for people for various, uh, various indications. Um, the vast majority of hiatal hernias do not need to be uh, fixed. Um, the, and the, the major, or the only real treatment, boy, I'm trying to find my, my hernia picture here. There it is. Um, the, the only treatment really is, is surgery to, um, to lower, to sort of, um, drag the stomach back below the diaphragm where it belongs and to cinch up that, uh, um, diaphragmatic hiatus. Uh, now the vast majority of people do not need this. Um, however, some people who have very large hernias, uh, which may cause actually uh, trouble swallowing or where the hernia can actually push on the lungs and cause shortness of breath or where food gets, gets stuck. Uh, those people do need surgical correction, but the vast majority of people with small hiatal hernias, uh, it's more of a nuisance than anything really dangerous. Um, and what do you think about that, Anna? No, I agree 100%. Uh, for the most part, we don't usually recommend uh, surgery, surgery to fix the hiatal hernia. And um, a couple of more questions, um, you know, because um, we need to wrap up at, at soon. Um, is uh, Barrett's esophagus reversible? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, there is um, there is so there is some thought that Barrett's can regress uh, on its own, or rather with treatment. Um, there is also, um, if that doesn't happen, um, there are many treatments uh, for Barrett's esophagus, primarily endoscopic treatments. And these include cryoablation, where the, the that abnormal Barrett's uh, lining is actually either frozen off or burned off. Um, and healthy uh, esophageal lining can then regenerate on top of that um, burned off uh, area. That's right. Um... Another question I think you, you pointed to, you mentioned uh, the risk of uh, C. diff and um, PPI use. Um, does PPI increase the likelihood of um, C. diff like recurrence? So I, I think it does, and correct me if I'm wrong, Anna, but mm -hmm. typically when, when, um, when a patient is diagnosed with C. diff, I try to get them off of their PPI mm -hmm. um, to try and help with treatment and to prevent recurrence. Uh, and if they need um, something for acid reflux, I try to maintain them on a, uh, a histamine receptor blocker like Pepsid. That's right. Um, let me see here. I'm trying to answer some of the questions uh, uh, online to like typing and answers because there are so many questions, so many great questions. Um, let's see here. I guess maybe one more. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, actually, quite a few people asked, and uh, I honestly do not know the answer to this. Uh, are there any exercises that, in, um, ex like, I guess, physical exercises that can um, 
reduce the risk, I mean, reduce the risk of acid reflux or affect or strengthen the sphincter, the low esophageal sphincter? Well, that's a great question. And I honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know of any um, physical exercises to strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and in terms of exercise itself, you know, there are certainly um, abdominal exercises, especially after a big meal can, can induce acid reflux uh, by increasing intra-abdominal pressure. But I, I don't know of the converse of any um, of any exercises to to prevent or lessen uh, uh, GERD. Having said all that, um, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, maintaining a healthy weight is is very important for managing uh, heartburn and acid reflux. So That's so right. get out there and exercise. I agree. <laughs> I'm a big advocate for exercise. I think it it cures everything and certainly acid reflux. Anyway, I think it's uh, time to wrap up. I think, um, you know, we answered, uh, we tried to answer most of the questions and we'll certainly address some like uh, with uh, written answers. Um, I'd like to thank you again for giving this terrific overview on GERD and answering so many of the questions the audience had. I certainly oh, learned a lot. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that you can go back on our website, the NYGA website, and you can watch this webinar again, and, um, and you can watch uh, some of our previous uh, webinars, which are all wonderful and very educational. And if you have questions and you're having a lot of issues with acid reflux, do not hesitate um, to come to the office and talk to your gastroenterologist and, uh, and perhaps consult with uh, our um, nutritionist as well, uh, which can always be very helpful. Um, Steve, thank you again and a uh, great job tonight. And um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining in um, tonight and, uh, you know, uh, joining us in this webinar. Thank you, Anna. Thanks everyone for joining. We'll see you next time.